also around that time, uh, women can also start experiencing thyroid issues. So low thyroid function can occur around that time. And some women don't quite understand what's going on. They've noticed that they're getting a whole lot of symptoms of brain fog, cold hands and feet and dry skin, and their weight has crept up and their diet hasn't changed. Quite often I look for certain red flags um, to indicate that they might have low thyroid function. And if that's the case, then of course I'm going to request uh, a full blood panel with thyroid antibodies to see if the thyroid uh, is having a factor for them. Hello and welcome to the Wellness Trinity Podcast, where we interview top holistic experts and bring you natural solutions for modern day wellness. Let's get started with your host, Dr. Jacqueline. Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining the Wellness Train Podcast. I'm Dr. Jacqueline from thewellnesstraining.com, where we provide natural solutions for modern day wellness. Today, we're going to discuss on our Women's Health Series, Mastering Menopause Naturally with Melissa Byrne, who is a naturopath in Australia. What we discuss in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. What you do with the information is to be used at your discretion as the recommendations are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Are you having a hard time conceiving? Are you concerned about raising healthy children? Would you like to age gracefully? These are all concerns that many women have. And in order to have healthy pregnancies and children, and age gracefully with youthful skin, vibrant wellness, and incredible joints, we need to thoroughly cleanse the body in this day and age because there are more than 85,000 chemicals that are just plaguing the earth. And these chemicals cause a whole slew of problems. And a lot of it is related to the backup in the liver that causes diminished hormone production. Our protocols at the Wellness Trinity systematically removes layers of infections and toxins thus fully cleansing the body. It gets you back to homeostasis where your body is happiest and healthiest when done correctly. I am happy to be on this protocol and I'm actually waiting to get pregnant because I want myself and my husband to be thoroughly cleansed before I even think of having a baby. And I don't fear growing old and falling apart because I know that if my body is at homeostasis, it's going to be just fine. I was told I look 10 years younger in my new headshot, so this stuff works. Check out the link in the show notes to schedule your free 15-minute consultation to discover if we are a good fit to work together. And if so, I will help you get to the root of your health challenges. So I met Melissa on, uh, I believe it was Instagram, and she was following my page and liking things. And I noticed over time, this naturopath was following me. And she was from Australia, which is even more exciting that I had a a follower from Australia. And she was also a naturopath too, which of course is my love. And so I I reached out to her one day and thanked her for all all her engagement. And and then we became friends. And at some point I decided, you know what, I'm doing this woman's health series and who, who better to ask than Melissa, who is, uh, she, she, you know, she does everything that traditional naturopaths do, but she has this passion for helping women that are going through women, menopause. So Melissa is, uh, she has a bachelor's of health science in naturopathy and a metab- she's also a metabolic balance practitioner. She practices in two clinics in Al- Adela. Oh no, you're going to have to tell me how to say that. How do you say that, Melissa? Adelaide. Adelaide. Sorry about that. Adelaide, (laughs) Australia. I am definitely need to learn my geography in Australia. (laughs) Adelaide, Australia. And you can learn more about her at melissaburnnaturopath.com and .au. I'll put that in the show notes below if you guys want to get a hold of her. So, Melissa, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here, Dr. Jackie. So can you just explain, like, how did you get into naturopathy to begin with? I mean, it seems like everybody has some type of profound story of how they end up in this field. Yes. So uh, years ago, when I was in my 20s, my husband, then partner, and I traveled through 
India and Southeast Asia. And it was during our travels that I actually succumbed to Guardia in India. And I experienced a lot of gut health issues following that. And on my return to Australia, uh, I had a lot of gut issues. And it was through my, uh, I guess, going down and seeing doctors mainstream and not getting much help that I sought the services of a naturopath. And I noticed after changing my diet and taking herbal supplements that my health improved dramatically because the approach was treating the whole person. And that really fostered my passion for nutrition. Uh, but however, it wasn't until I was around 40 years of age after I'd had some had my children that I decided to go and study and become a degree qualified naturopath. That's wonderful. Yeah, Giardia, the parasites, you know, something that we always talk about here in the Wellness Trinity and with Cellcore, it's it's a huge staple of what Cellcore Biosciences does. And that's a company I, I work for. I don't know if you're aware of that I work for that company now. And um, I mean, they have really just hit the nail on those parasites. So I'm glad that you discovered that you had Giardia because a lot of people don't even realize that parasites are even a problem. So the, for the fact that you realize that you had that issue and, and were able to deal with it and, and then create a career out of it, I mean, that's just fabulous hearing that. Well, we know that the, the cornerstone to good health is good gut health. And I guess from personal experience, I really had that opportunity of learning about how to look after my health better. Yeah, yeah. So again, you know, it's the reason why most of us find ourselves in this field. Usually it's either we have a story or a family member has a story that we're trying to fight for their lives. And uh, for me, my, my father passed away at a young age. So just seeing that helped me to appreciate life more. And then, uh, you know, I dealt with my own issues. Um, I never was diagnosed with cancer or anything like that, but losing hair and being chronically fatigued and and just not feeling good emotionally, et cetera, led me down this path as well. And, and then just seeing all the issues that everyone else around me was dealing with, um, I started to realize, wow, there's, there's other issues and, and challenges that we need to deal with if we're gonna get to the root of people's health challenges. So mm -hmm. Melissa, um, you know, you like to work with people, women that have menopause, that are going through menopause. And I'm just curious, what, what what sparks your fire about working with people, working with women going through menopause? Why is that somewhat of a niche for you? Uh, that's a good question. It just evolved, actually. Uh, I began to notice that more women in their late 40s and 50s began seeing me in clinic. And I could see that they're at the stage of life where they've raised their children and they're looking after aging parents and they're working and they uh, tend to have their own, uh, I guess, complaints with changes in hormones at that time. Uh, they're fatigued and over the years, the weight has crept on as well and maybe they have uh, sleep disturbances. But working with this, I guess, group, um, I really became quite fond of working with these women and empathising with their situation. Um, and possibly because I'm getting near to that point myself, but I could really uh, understand their difficulties, their challenges and their frustrations. Mm -hmm. And I really do get satisfaction out of teaching women how to become more empowered about their health choices and their life so that they can feel better and have more energy. Um, and certainly if they have another 30 years ahead of them or more, that they can live those years in a really good quality health. So um, I guess it's just been um, a natural evolution, I would say, or organic growth in that area. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely think it's something that's really needed to touch on that I don't think we need to grow old and necessarily fall apart and we can age gracefully 
I just interviewed someone today, actually, too, who was talking about the same thing about that period of life where, yeah, we're getting older, but I mean, it's all about being able to have a good quality of life at that time. I mean, who wants to be having to be taken care of or on tons of medications or not feeling good the, the second half of their life? Mm. I don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. So what hormonal changes happen at menopause? Um, so I guess some people don't know what is menopause. Um, and really the word menopause means stopping menstruation. And this occurs when the last menstrual period has occurred 12 months or more previously. And the normal age can be anywhere from 45 to 55. However, the average age is about 50 to 51 years of age. So women are aware that their hormones are changing. They may not understand what hormones are involved. And I guess uh, if people haven't got a medical background or an understanding of the body, they tend to be aware, oh, I don't have enough estrogen. Uh, and so I'm getting a whole lot of symptoms because I no longer have estrogen. But I like to explain to women that estrogen just doesn't stop and estrogen is an umbrella term for three different types of estrogen. So in, men in menstruating women, E2 or estradiol is the primary estrogen and it's quite strong. But as our ovarian reserve declines at around 50 years of age, we lose, I guess, that production of estrogen from the ovaries. Um, and so that is one, one of the hormones. But of course, we then have declines in progesterone because it, as you ovulate, there's uh, the corpus luteum that releases the, the ovum if you're not ovulating, then you're not producing progesterone either. Um, but it, it just doesn't end there. Um, when it comes to estrogen, that is synthesized through um, the, by the adrenal glands. So we do have estrogen come from other places in the body. And we also have it uh, synthesized in fat tissue and in muscle as well. But progesterone levels also drop, and we also notice that testosterone reduces as well. So it decreases by about 15% around menopause, mm -hmm. and testosterone secretion from the ovaries after menopause varies from woman to woman. Mm -hmm. However, the adrenal glands become the main source of androgens uh, after menopause. So I guess mm -hmm. when we're looking at hormones, there's other hormones, uh, gonadotropins, like luteinizing and luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Well, they begin to increase because ovulation is starting to reduce and then at menopause, it actually stops. Hmm, okay. Okay, so why do people get hot flashes and night sweats during this time? Yes, yeah, so during menopause, women experience what we call vasomotor symptoms such as hot flushes and night, uh, night sweats and it's really because both luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone are released every 60 to 90 minutes in small bursts and the release of lut luteinizing hormone has been shown to coincide with hot flushes at the same time there's a a concomitant decrease in estradiol. So they tend to be, uh, I guess, the changes in the hormones prompts women to get those hot flushes. And I guess we look at it that they're triggered by increasing activity in the hypothalamus, as well as an increase in the gonadotropin releasing hormone, which influences those release of hormones from the anterior pituitary. Hmm. So do you think that it's possible that women could possibly go through menopause, even the before and the after parts of it without having those night sweats and hot flashes? 
Oh, definitely. There's quite a few factors that I guess will make a difference to how women uh, go through the transition. So I guess in a way outside of the body, it's partly our perception of um, what we feel is uh, normal or what we might feel quite distressing because our body is experiencing these changes. Um, so I guess our attitudes, our perceptions slightly have an, um, an influence and mm -hmm. at times looking how our mother transited during that time, how, how did they travel through menopause, but we know that other factors such as diet and stress and lifestyle and social connections can certainly have an impact on how well um, or how much we experience those symptoms. Okay. So are there herbs that you recommend or any other nutraceuticals that you recommend during that time so people can go through it with e more ease? Oh, absolutely. So uh, phytoestrogens are uh, possibly the, the food group that most people may have heard something about. So phytoestrogens are estrogens that have a similar similar molecular structure to our own endogenous estrogens and they have the same exert the same activity they but they lightly stimulate our estrogen receptors so what we're looking at are trying to include more foods that are higher in these phytoestrogens one we're quite familiar with is of course soy and there have been many studies to show that women in countries where they consume fermented soy can have experienced uh, very little in the way of menopausal symptoms. So including, uh, I would say, fermented soy. There's many soy products that are available, but I'm not, uh, I don't tend to encourage consumption of soy products where there's processed soy and there there are a lot of as we know dr jackie that there are a lot of foods that are processed that have forms of soy that really don't have great health benefits for us mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. when we're talking about foods that can really help with menopause uh foods like miso and natto and tempeh and fermented um, tofu can be quite good. I also ask or recommend for women to get flax seeds because these are high in phytoestrogens. So flax seeds, especially ground flax seeds, to try and get a, cup, a, a dessert spoon or more in the diet a day could really help alleviate those symptoms. There's other foods as well which I like to recommend and they're foods that are really good for helping our liver detoxify um, estrogens because the liver is really much a part of hormone metabolism. So what do you suggest for the liver? The liver actually likes us to not have alcohol and to have a really clean <laughs> diet. Um, so as few processed foods as possible and really it's about getting a whole food diet, getting foods in their natural form, uh, but particularly cruciferous type foods, which are high um, in compounds like indole 3 carbonyl. So broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, they're really good liver foods that can help with our phase two detoxification. Okay, so cruciferous foods. What about broccoli sprouts? Do you know anything about broccoli sprouts? Oh, of course. How can I not mention broccoli sprouts? It's a, I mean, it's a, a big thing that people have been talking about nowadays. I, mean, I studied at Hippocrates Health Institute in Florida, and we were all about the sprouts back then. But honestly, I don't even remember talking about broccoli sprouts then. And then all of a sudden, everyone's talking about broccoli sprouts. And some of the supplements I use even have it in it. Um, so anyways, I would love to hear what you have to say about broccoli sprouts. 
Absolutely. So uh, broccoli sprouts um, are high in sulforaphane, which induces phase two detoxification enzymes. Um, so we do have it. We do have practitioner products in Australia that do have broccoli sprout powder. And I actually tend to prescribe a lot of that powder to females with hormone imbalances and not just menopause, but also uh, women that are having, uh, I guess, hormone imbalances, menstruating women, whether they have short cycles or long cycles. I think most women would benefit from a supplement if they can't get actual or they don't grow or buy uh, broccoli sprouts. And to be quite honest, as you would agree, uh, Dr. Jackie, that you have to have a lot of broccoli sprouts to really affect mm -hmm. those um, enzymes. Yeah, I think with most herbs, you generally have to do a lot to, to be able to get to the root of what you're trying to deal with with the herb. Um, so at some point with my clients, they, they notice their doses going up and up. <laughs> and I just explained to them that at some, in the beginning, a little can go a long way. Um, but for certain things that we're trying to do, like move out pathogens, sometimes you got to go in the machine gun approach and, and really, you know, come in and, and, you know, give a lot of that type of substance, to that person so that they can get the effect that they need. So, so I agree. I mean, it just depends on where the person's at and what you're trying to achieve. Um, but, um, we have a supplement with cell that has broccoli sprout extract. So it's even more mm -hmm. concentrated. So I, I definitely agree that it is, it can be hard to eat a lot of them. Um, although on the other side of it, if someone's eating broccoli sprouts versus the full grown plant, you're getting way more nutrients in that little sprout versus if it's fully mm -hmm. grown too. So, so you can even think about it like that. You're even just a handful of broccoli sprouts, you're getting more nutrients than your handful of full grown broccoli. So we grow them and we have a whole farm, um, microgreen farm, and I have all kinds of stuff growing, wheatgrass and broccoli sprouts, uh, radish sprouts. Uh, what else do we have? Onions and onion sprouts. They're all sprouts. They're all, or microgreens. Uh, I used to work at a microgreen farm and they corrected me on that. They're like, it's microgreens, Jacqueline. Sprouts are when they're smaller and they're not planted and all that. So anyways, um, thank you for expanding on that. Now we talked about food, we talked about the liver and you talked about how certain cruciferous vegetables and broccoli sprouts affect phase two detoxification. Can you explain the difference between the different phases and the detoxification in the liver? Yes, yeah, sure. So phase one, um, where a lot of substances go through, they, it's called phase one. And uh, what happens is it's making a lot of uh, fat soluble toxins become more water soluble. So through the process of biotransformation, those fat soluble, uh, whether they're toxins or metabolites from hormones, they go through a process where they need to be made uh, less toxic to the body and more water soluble. So through the process of biotransformation and we call phase two conjugate. So in between phase one and phase two, substances are quite reactive and uh, they, they're free radicals, so they're quite damaging to the body. And when those substances are combined with an amino acid, um, they're conjugated, they're then escorted out of the body, either via the kidneys or through the bowel. So when it comes to the liver, we want to make sure that there are we're having a diet, we're including foods that uh, can, I guess, improve those processes through the liver. And that is a combination of antioxidants, B vitamins, and of course, different amino acids to help facilitate those different pathways. Um, I think the, the role of the liver is so underappreciated when it comes to our health and no matter what whether you have a gut issue whether you have immune issues or allergies we really need to look at supporting the liver because to be quite honest uh, I guess 
in modern day diet, individuals are not consuming enough foods. Um, they may not get enough vegetables. Their gut might be compromised and they think they're getting enough protein, but are they digesting and absorbing mm. those proteins that we're getting those amino acids? So, um, and of course, our body burden of toxins is so great today because we have thousands of chemicals that are being released every year through our food chain in our environment. And a lot of those have not been rigorously tested and we're having exposure and i would say that our greatest dangers to human health are not being seen they're the unseen things so we need to um optimize liver mm -hmm. and i guess women really notice that their hormones are, 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 are affected through um through the way we live today mm -hmm. so I feel like this is a, a obvious question, but I want to hear what you have to say. Um, so have you seen that correlation with the toxic load and people going through menopause not as nicely? Definitely. I guess when we're looking at the age of when women are going into menopause, they have had longer time on the planet to be exposed to different toxins and we know that these toxins are storing in our nervous system and also in our fat cells so i i see women around that age group where they may have gained weight and they come to me because they want to improve uh, or rather eliminate those hot flushes and night sweats uh, but sometimes I need to have a talk to them about mm. their weight as well, although most of them will already know that they need to lose weight. And we know that when you start mm. losing weight, a lot of those toxins are being released from fat cells. And um, I really need to support their liver during that time. But we also looking at the liver is not particularly happy if you're having night sweats as well. So a lot of your mm. symptoms are actually improved by supporting the liver function and liver detoxification. Oh, wow. 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 Definitely something to think about if someone is having night sweats, it, it's supporting that liver, um, making sure that you're completely ridding it of all the toxins and infections that it's being clouded with. So what healthy lifestyle habits can women adopt um, to support their health during this time? Um, I think that's a really, of course, a, a really important question, but women need to actually, uh, I guess, focus on what they're doing in their lives. What is their diet like? So, of course, as a naturopath, we help them navigate their diet. And if they, a lot of people will go through, I guess spurts where they eat really well and eat really clean, but then these habits creep in and coffee comes mm. in and and uh, and of course we like to socialize, but wine can come into it. And it's really about educating women to understand that, for example, alcohol is really, uh, I guess, not a great thing. It really impacts liver detoxification in a bad way so it's teaching women that there are foods that can actually uh, I guess work against or contribute to their symptoms so it's about working on a whole food diet so discussing about diet exercise is really important and it's sometimes not enough to do mild exercise the studies have shown that uh, moderate to uh, more intense exercise can really help reduce symptoms at that time. But I also feel that for women, they need to look at their stress levels. Uh, stress is a really big factor to a lot of, uh, I guess, health complaints today. Um, it's certainly 
when we're talking about chronic disease, stress is a factor. So it's trying to give women the tools and teach them um, that stress is impacting and to find ways that they can not escape the stress. I don't think any of us can, but how they can uh, adapt to it better. So exercise, again, is a really important factor. For some people, it's meditation. I think meditation and yoga has a role. Um, and addressing that stress, but keeping uh, connected with people, which um, unfortunately COVID-19 really had an impact for people on their well-being, but connecting with friends and family and keeping happy and balanced emotionally is so important. Um, because it's possible that you could do all of the right things mm -hmm. and still get some mm -hmm. symptoms. But um, I think generally doing the best that you can to improve your health and well-being, your outcomes are going to be better. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. COVID-19 is such an interesting, um, it, just an interesting situation. The, the things that they want us to do seem very contrary to providing good health. Uh, one being you're isolating. If you're isolating from people, like you said, it's not really good for people's mental wellness, unless <laughs> they are not normally surrounded by good people, then I would say it's probably better to be alone than be around people that are toxic. Um, but if you have healthy relationships, then it's, it's a very good, healthy thing to, to have people in your life. Hopefully some of these people have people still you know that they live with or that they're close with that they can communicate with or even like zoom chats but i think there is something physical i'm curious what you think about when people gather together versus meeting on a zoom chat like we're doing right now um there's there's this whole gut microbiome and we have it on the microbiome on our skin etc and and there's something physical i think that happens when we're actually present with other people what do you think about that Oh, definitely. Uh, I think from an evolutionary perspective, we evolved in groups and I think it feels completely unnatural to not be with people. And uh, I know that most people use social media as a form of communication, uh, but we can't forget the grassroots of actually having contact and sitting with someone near you, you really do feel their empathy, their understanding. There is a different level of connection when you meet with someone face to face as compared to a screen. As much as I love the privilege of what modern day life has given us with technology, I can't deny that, but every time I catch up with a friend, I really feel different, so much different in a way that perhaps I wouldn't get that through talking to someone through Zoom. So I think connection is so vitally important and it gives you meaning um, and uh, it really is the spice of life, isn't it? And with that, naturopathy we look at the balance between the, the mental the physical the emotional and the spiritual so we need to factor in that our spiritual and our emotional health is really improved through connecting socially to people that understand us and appreciate us and um and and i think that just has um unseen or unrecognized impacts on our health and well-being mm -hmm. yeah. yeah now have you found that with this whole situation going on um, since the the corona craziness started happening basically <laughs> um, do you find that there's more people coming to you where you know a huge root is stress i would say uh, during covid 19 uh, I, I guess during the thick of the ec epidemic, uh, not many people were going out, but I think people were at home and they had time to actually really focus on their health a bit more. 
and I know in Australia, uh, apparently, statistically, it was uh, said that people actually ate more and put on weight because they were home and they were closer to the fridge. And certainly, a lot of people started working from home where normally they were going into a workplace or office. Um, so I think that time at home uh, and not having uh, as many places to go and things to do for some people really gave them an opportunity to look at their health and well-being. And as the restrictions have lifted here in South Australia, I've noticed uh, I actually did have quite a lot of new clients come in that I don't feel would otherwise have come in had it not been for COVID-19. And interestingly, I've had more people coming in about their immune health. So um, they've focused on perhaps if I'm not well to start with and I happen to get coronavirus, what, how will I cope with that? So I think it has really encouraged people to focus more on their health and especially mm -hmm. their immune health. Um, and how they can optimise that. So I would say, yes, I've noticed there's been a shift and people want to know what they can do to make their immune system better um, so that they can prevent perhaps getting unwell or if they do, that they will uh, be able to recover well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was well said. I, I believe the same thing too. When it, we were going through all that, as much as it seemed just not very nice to go through and everyone's scared about their health, the one thing that I kept seeing was people are waking up and wanting to know how to take care of themselves. I think a lot mm -hmm. of people have been asleep to um, those fundamental truths that naturopathy and uh, holistic, functional, et cetera, medicine can provide. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's just fundamental roots of how, what it means to be healthy. And it was a huge wake up call. I think when COVID-19 happened, where people were finally like, wait a second, how, what would I do? What would I do if I, I got exposed to this? And um, now, now their, their life seems a little bit more at risk. And it's something that we should always have thought about, but at the same time, um, you know, that was the thing that switched the flipped the switch for a lot of people, I think, that were not thinking about it. And in a positive way, um, you know, a lot of people are still waiting for this vaccine, which I'm not fond of. That's a little story in itself. Um, but, you know, the rest of us, I think, are, are going out and trying to figure out what are what are solutions of how how to stay healthy. And, and that goes back to the immune system. What does it mean to have a strong immune system in the first place is really the question people should ask themselves because it's so much more than just taking vitamin C. Mm. If our whole body is compromised in different ways for, with pathogens and heavy metals and aluminum, et cetera, they're just not going to be having a great immune system. So anyways, COVID-19 created its own stress in itself. Obviously, it's what you focus on um, can can really help keep you sane during that time. And I think that there, there are positives like this uh, where mm. people are actually gaining some good from this. I mean, we're going to get past this one day, I believe, and, and we're going to look back and there's going to be a whole bunch of people that are on the, the holistic bandwagon now <laughs> because <laughs> of COVID-19. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Thank you for whoever created this whole situation. <laughs> <laughs> So anyways, let's get back on track with menopause. So women, um, so women can notice weight gain, right? Around their abdomen in their late forties and fifties, uh, you know, when they're going through this transition in their life, why, why is that? Yeah. So what, um, women do notice that the weight can creep on definitely around their waist and they didn't have that before. Um, so really what happens is, um, we lose some of our fat burning hormones. So progesterone actually is a fat burning hormone and we lose that. Um, but our, uh, I guess our distribution of, of fat changes during that time. So um, we notice that the drop in estrogen and that change in the testosterone does encourage that 
um, I guess, that visceral uh, fat around the waist. But we know too that uh, metabolism slows down and that's at rest, but also in exercise. So I quite often get women that come in and say, oh, I'm being careful what I'm eating and I'm exercising so much and I just can't get, get this weight off. Mm -hmm. And it's all happened around menopause. And that is so true. Metabolism slows down and it seems almost unfair, but we have to really watch what we eat. And I say quite often to those uh, women that what you could eat in your 20s and get away with, you can't do it so much in, in your 50s and 60s. But also um, during that time, women might be more sedentary if they're not exercising there in jobs or they're looking after parents or they're looking after kids so women may not be doing quite the, the amount of exercise that they need to certainly as per the world health organization recommendations on how much exercise uh, that we should be getting um, so i guess it's looking at that but looking at the whole person we look at their stress levels. Elevated cortisol opposes the action of insulin. So if you're stressed, it's going to encourage um, fat deposition as well. Um, so they're things other than the diet. But also around that time, uh, women can also start experiencing thyroid issues. So low thyroid function can occur around that time. And some women don't quite understand what's going on. They've noticed that they're getting a whole lot of symptoms of brain fog, cold hands and feet and dry skin, and their weight has crept up and their diet hasn't changed. Quite often I look for certain red flags um, to indicate that they might have low thyroid function. And if that's the case, then of course, I'm going to request uh, a full blood panel with thyroid antibodies to see if the thyroid uh, is having a factor for them. So it can be the change in sex hormones, but we also need to look holistically as well at diet, at exercise, at stress, at thyroid health, and also sleep because if you're not sleeping unfortunately it's a catalyst for having higher cortisol um, so that can work negatively and encourage weight gain as well mm -hmm. yeah so there's a lot of ideas of stress in general that can help to that can cause this increase in cortisol which kind of causes belly fat it sounds like um, the thyroid do you find that if people are more balanced in their chemistry, that their thyroid is functioning better when they're, they're going through menopause? Uh, definitely. Um, so the good thing is if we can get onto thyroid fairly early and make those changes, in particular, I like to really encourage women to have a, a, an anti-inflammatory diet and sometimes that is doing the autoimmune protocol type diet because it's reducing all the processed foods, um, the foods that are higher in omega-6. So we're changing our omega-3, our omega-6 ratio. Um, but if I can encourage women to really focus on having a whole food diet, what I do recommend to some of uh, my clients is if they're wanting to lose weight and they're finding that they're getting a lot of hormone as vasomotor symptoms, I quite often may suggest that they do uh, a really good program called my metabolic, well, not mine, but uh, what I offer metabolic balance. Um, and it's where uh, it's actually a weight loss program, but it uh, where people get a diet, an individualised diet for them 
And what that does is it helps reduce uh, weight, it helps reduce inflammation. And in fact, women that have thyroid issues, it, it can actually, um, has helped some clients get their thyroid antibodies down. So if they're eating well and taking care of themselves, then it is possible to actually, and trying to look at where toxins are coming in. So not brushing, uh, not using um, uh, fluoride toothpaste. I look at if they've got mercury or amalgam oh. filling. I'm looking at how toxins are coming in in their home environment, making sure that their home is more green, going to more, um, I guess, safer options for house cleaning products. What are they putting on their skin? Uh, as we do holistically, looking what's in the environment, what they're putting on their skin, cleaning the diet, that will all make a difference. And reducing stress is really important for thyroid as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that stress in general just drains every everything. We burn more of our nutrients that way that our body needs to make these hormones. So you talked about the metabolic balance diet plan. Yeah. So how, how do you figure out how to individualize people's diet? Is it like an app or is it some type of equation? I mean, how are you going about this with this program? So, so metabolic balance is actually, um, uh, I, it's a program that came from, it originated in Germany, but it's uh, available to naturopaths or nutritionists to become a coach um, and there are practitioners all around the world but metabolic balance is a program where it's scientific so what I do is um, or what you need to do to get an individualized program is I get a collation of data so it's based on about 50 blood chemistry uh, takes into account the medications that people are taking, what health conditions they have, what their height, their weight, their BMI, their measurements, and all that data gets put into the metabolic balance uh, program. And then about 24 to 48 hours later, a program is devised for that person. Um, and it has foods that will be suitable for them to help lose the weight and balance their metabolism. So I don't actually put the program together. Um, it's put together by people in metabolic balance. And, um, and so that person will get an individualized eating plan where they will have foods, uh, it's all whole foods. So there's no supplements, there's no shakes, it really falls into naturopathic whole food principles. So there'll be three meals a day, but it does have uh, the program, they do need to follow eight rules. And the rules are there to help, really what it does is it balances insulin. Mm. So when we help lower insulin, and insulin, uh, probably one of those hormones that we know through the literature that it high insulin, yes, it contributes to pre-diabetes and diabetes, but it has a factor in cardiovascular disease. And of course, um, in neurological um, conditions of possibly Alzheimer's and, and those um, diseases of age, aging, we're looking at insulin being probably not uh, really great for us, especially if it's elevated in the blood all the time. So metabolic balance really helps reduce insulin. And when we start reducing that, then we encourage fat burning. Mm. So um, just changing the profile of those metabolic hormones really improves uh, leptin, Ghrelin, and also it has an effect on our sex hormones as well. So women can actually find they lose weight, they sleep better, 
um, they, uh, their cholesterol will go down, their fasting blood glucose will improve. Um, and also comes with that, their hot flushes and night sweat gets better, but really the diet is so clean and it encourages a whole lot of water intake that I would say um, it, it works on the liver as well. So mm. working on reducing inflammation, improving liver function, reducing weight, um, so many parameters that I really do love the metabolic balance program. Mm -hmm. Does it also consider your, where you are from, your ancestors, like your DNA? Uh, so no, it, it doesn't take that into account really. Um, but I would say it takes in a whole lot of other information. So when I have women that come in and I explain that this program may help them, um, sometimes they'll say, oh, but what if I have foods on the program that I don't like? They can actually specify foods that they don't have or don't like. So they can exclude, choose to exclude foods that they don't like. Um, so it's, it's sort of adapting to, to them in that way. And as I said, it, it considers what medications and what health conditions that they mm -hmm. currently have. But no, um, I don't think it looks at it ancestrally or from a genetic side. But I've had this discussion with other practitioners as in what is a good diet for someone, um, especially if they're, they have ancestry that goes back to China. Uh, but I think it can be really hard because um, not knowing exactly where your ancestors originated from and if they came from different areas in the world, it can be extremely hard to nail down. I, it, it's just my opinion, not based on science, um, for some individuals, not all individuals, but for some individuals knowing exactly what they should be eating based on their DNA uh, could, I, I don't see it as a black and white thing for some mm. people. Yeah. Um, yeah, the more I look into diet too, I think um, there's some basic fundamentals uh, that go across the board because we're a human being. Um, but there are those intricacies, which is just like using herbs and um, mm -hmm. other, I call them biohacking, you know, ways to maximize our body's chemistry. Uh, even with food, we can, we can tweak that and make it work, you know, figure out what works best for our body as well too. So thank you for touching on that. That's a new program I've never heard of. So I'm, I'm excited to, to look into that a little bit more. Thank you. And I have to just add in too that I'm a herbalist. So I do use nutritional supplements, but I use herbal medicines um, to help balance the hormones and help balance the body. So um, we love to do that. We've got wonderful herbs that, can really support hormones during the change. Which ones are your favorites for that? Uh, I love Romania. I love Sisyphus, Shadavari, Black Cohosh. Uh, I love Passion Flower, Wild Yam, um, liver herbs such as Dandelion Root, Shisandra, Globe Artichoke, uh, also turmeric there's so many herbs but um i i use chase tree a lot too mm. peony uh so i really do love using herbs as well as diet to help yeah, balance herbs are wonderful now are you mixing them yourself or just recommending them one by one or do you have certain formulations you like to use uh i mix i mix them up so i individualize a herb mix. Uh, so how do you decide which ones if someone's going through menopause um, if they're wanting to let's say they're like I need help with my hot flashes 
how do you individualize it for the person, um, even if some of the herbs do similar things? But, uh, so I individualize it based on what I think might be contributing to their hot flushes. So if I feel that from taking the case that they may have more of a toxic body burden and it might be more the liver, I might focus more on putting liver herbs in. If I have a, a client that is incredibly stressed and I can see that she has work stress, family stress, then I will make sure that I incorporate herbs that are adaptogens and, and support the adrenal glands. So Romania is probably one of my favourites. Sometimes I use licorice root. Withania, withania is uh, a beautiful uh, non-stimulating adaptogen herb and it also can support the thyroid as well and iron. It, it can help with iron as well. I may use withania. So it's taking in the picture of the whole person and understanding what I feel might be more the key drivers for their hot flushes. Um, and, and in that way, I can, I guess, choose the herbs that I feel are indicated for uh, for them based on the underlying drivers or causes. Okay, so are you usually mixing this all in one? Is it like, do you make it as a tea or do you put it in capsules? Or how do you give this to people? Uh, I use uh, herbal extracts. So they're extracts okay. of herbs that are in a liquid. Mm -hmm. So, but they can come in tablet uh, formulations as well. The liquid herbs are extracted in water and alcohol, otherwise known as tinctures as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I will do liquid herbs and I like them because they're, they're very rapidly absorbed. So mm -hmm. if people don't have gut function, I know that the liquid herbs are absorbed very quickly. The thing, I guess the hurdle with prescribing liquid herbs is that they can taste pretty bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> herbs are in yeah. the mix. That's true. That's true. Um, um, I find that if we dilute them in water, um, I don't know, I personally don't really care too much if I know no. it help me, except for wheatgrass. <laughs> <laughs> I do recommend it, um, but I do not like how that tastes at all. Uh, but most most things I can I can deal with the bitter taste. Um, I don't know. There's something about wheatgrass though. Maybe I need it. <laughs> Sometimes um, we do need the things that we find the hardest to have. But I I don't know about you, but I found that interesting clients will have the herbs and come back and say, "Oh, that doesn't taste good," but I feel like my body needs it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's true too. You could feel it sometimes when you take those herbs. Um, at, at Cellcore, we have certain liquid tinctures too. And when I drink them, I literally feel like calm, but just a, alive and well. And, and I don't even know, it's a mixture of a bunch of things going on at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been um, down on my herbs uh, lately and I'm like, I can't wait till they come in the mail again. Because um, yeah. they are powerful. When, they're, when you have the right ones that you need, and it helps balance that chemistry. I mean, it definitely feels really good to have those liquid tinctures. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look past it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't let the taste bother, or like get in the way of you doing it. Cause uh, I think sometimes too people, they actually will gain a taste for some of these herbs too. Yeah. We're not, a lot of times we're not trained to eat bitter foods um, in this day and mm. age. And so eating an herb uh, or taking an herb and a tincture, et cetera, is, is sometimes, a little bit too much for some people, but over time we can develop that bitter taste for these herbs too. That's true. Yeah, and and it's actually quite satisfying when I see clients that were a bit resistant at the beginning to taking the herbal extracts, but then over time, uh, like I might not see them regularly, but I get messages at the clinic from people can you leave my 
my potion at reception to come. I get they get called different names, of course. Um, uh, and and looks, I, it's interesting. I've had uh, obviously clients uh, with a mainstream medical education that have, you know, come in and said, "Look, I I have to try natural medicine. I don't know if I really believe it, but." It's quite funny when they have improvement and they become a convert then and and uh, and they'll say, is there a, a cauldron somewhere in this clinic room and you're mixing up all your herbs and <laughs> I have a bit of fun with it. Um, I, I do try and educate clients that we do have herbs that are supported by scientific evidence. They are not all just traditional. Uh, but I think they just find it a little bit, I don't know what the word is, but they find it a little bit mystical or magical, but uh, <laughs> I don't like to, to actually refer to the herbs as, as that way because uh, we know that uh, for some of our wonderful herbs that we do have that uh, scientific evidence, no, maybe not a, not a lot, um, but um, I do like to explain, but I'm quite transparent that if I use herbs, I will say that they have a history of traditional use, that they will really support and they're tonic. They're not habit forming. They don't taste good, uh, but they have uh, different effects on the body. So they work differently from pharmaceuticals. They're not having just one specific action at, mm -hmm. at the receptor they're working on different pathways and and for some of them it's not really well understood but when you see the improvement in your client with their symptoms with their well-being and they they keep asking for the tonics and some of my clients will say i can't live without them which um i feel that's uh not really what i want for them but i guess uh if i knowing that they're generally well tolerated um and that the dosing uh is safe for them and i consider what pharmaceuticals that they're on and i monitor them and they check in with me now and then uh, it's really quite satisfying to see how well the herbs work mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, I mean, I don't know what are common herbs people use in food in Australia, but in America, I mean, it's very common. You go to the store and you buy cilantro and you buy basil and um, parsley I mean, right from the store. Those are those can be used therapeutically, even 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 just those ones that we find from the store. So I don't know why we have to overcomplicate this in general in society that herbs could be used for a medicine or food can be used as a medicine. The father of medicine said, Hippocrates said, let their food be their medicine. So I don't understand why we have to think this is some mystical thing that we can use food and, and herbs in this in this way, you know? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you, like you said earlier with the broccoli sprouts, sometimes we need very concentrated amounts of these to do what they need to do. Um, I know that you have clients that um, maybe get concerned or even yourself along that if people are using this for a longer duration of time that maybe it's not so good or not but I mean every week I go to the store and buy cilantro I mean it's not it's not a weird thing in my book you know what I mean so yeah. every week yeah. I go to the store buy kale or I buy yeah. other types of leafy greens or I grow my microgreens so um, you know when we're talking about herbs we're talking about concentrated medicine pretty much it's even in the bible it says you let mm. the, let the um, herbs be used for your food uh, your medicine sorry so yeah. anyways I just wanted to debunk that whole thing because <laughs> <laughs> I get it too I mean we're not witches we're <laughs> yeah. I swear we're just using God's creation and helping people with it <laughs> absolutely it's what nature has given us and um unfortunately uh I think natural medicine has really I know in Australia we've really um, had to, I guess, fight for our industry and our um, our credibility 
and um, and I don't know there could be other motives involved here but uh, but we know as practitioners we know that it does work mm -hmm. and, and we have the clinical um, evidence to show for that so um, yeah it's, it's just such a shame that we're forever having to educate people on this and it's not something to be frightened of or um, wary of that it can actually work so <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Melissa, for coming on the show. And thank you for so much for shedding that light and explaining to people about how this is, this is not weird voodoo stuff. It's, it really is stuff that the body needs, if, especially if it's in balance. We can use these really strong, potent herbs that, to help bring that body into balance. And sometimes it doesn't even need to be the strongest doses. Sometimes we're just a little bit off. So that's where someone like and Melissa, who's a naturopath, um, can can come in and tweak that for you. So thank you again for shedding light on menopause as well and um, all the amazing wisdom that you provided with that. Thank you for having me on the show today, Jacqueline. It's been lovely to actually interact with you on Instagram, but such a pleasure for me to have had this discussion and be able to share some of my knowledge and uh, my my clinical I guess yeah clinical knowledge of what I do in Australia with uh, I guess your followers and people over there yeah well I look forward to having more people out of the country on this podcast because I think that um, I, I think we all need to realize at the end of the day we're all human and we all we all need certain things to function um, and you know we talked about herbs and it's not foreign thing to use herbs in another country it's not i mean all over the around the world they're using things like herbs and natural medicine um so it, it, we, let's debunk this and i think that i think that as um you know the world gathers together and we shed this light then more people are going to be helped so thanks again for coming to the show thanks for sharing with our american audience and anyone else that hears this show I, I hope that it reaches australia now that that you're on it too so thank you again thanks jackie and thank you listeners for watching i i really do appreciate you guys um, this is why we do this otherwise it would not be fun speaking to myself <laughs> so i appreciate you listeners i i really hope this blessed you and those of you that are going through menopause you know i hope you got some some key nuggets from this. Those of you guys that are about to go through menopause or maybe even you're young and you're trying to prepare, I think that's a wise thing to do. Um, you know, Melissa is a great resource. You can find her at Melissa. Um, her last name is B-Y-R-N-E, naturopath.com.au. And I'll have the link in the show notes so you can get that and spell it right. And I appreciate you guys again. Thanks for joining and we will tune again next week. Have a blessed day. Thank you for listening to the Wellness Trinity podcast. Be sure to subscribe for more wellness tips to help you achieve optimal health. Don't forget to rate and review so we can continue to bring you the best content. See you on the next episode.